All right, we are live. So um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Cannabis Live. We're live to our Cannabis Premium and Associate Producer members. Um, and everyone else in the community will be seeing this in the future. So if you aren't seeing this live, that's how you can uh, watch us these sorts of interviews live in the future. But we are very um, happy to welcome Mary Beth Sanchez today. She is an IPM consultant. I'll let her do her full intro in a second. But she has joined us today from Dr. Zimes to talk about IPM tips and strategies. We've got a bunch of questions that we've collected from the cannabis community that we're going to be um, asking Mary Beth. So thank you so much to the cannabis community that um, asked a whole bunch of questions. We've got 10 altogether that we'll be going through and we'll be going through kind of how to get started all the way through harvest and her various tips and and for success and everything else, her words of wisdom. Um, we also wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Zimes because they have a free sample promotion running right now. So make sure to check out drzimes.com slash cannabis and you can order your free sample. I literally just used mine the other day to clean my grow tent because I'm just about to sprout some seeds for my outdoor season. So already using the Dr. Zimes here. Um, well, Mary Beth, I would love to have you introduce yourself. Could you give uh, folks a little bit of background on who you are? And, and yeah, we'll go from there. Well, hello, and how do you do? And I have to say, that is the cutest dog in the back. What is your little dog's name? Oh, uh, my I phone ask? is... <laughs> My phone just started blowing up with notifications for some reason. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, anyways, that's my my dog, Josie. So, yeah, for the folks that are watching the video, my dog, Josie, um, it's funny. Right before we got on, Mary Beth was saying about background noise. Well, my background noise that I always have to deal with is dogs. So I put the dogs in the room with me to try to keep them under control. <laughs> good, good. Oh, okay. I love animals. That's one of my things. Well, when I got into this industry, it was kind of basically because I was raised as a farmer's daughter and I was always kind of into the growing of the plants and, you know, the nursery gardens, as well as the, uh, what my dad grew was uh, row crops and his father before him. And so, you know, they were into the traditional old fashioned uh, post World War II chemical farming that everybody else was doing. So there was nothing unique about uh, their method or style, but I know when I got into my early teens or preteens, my mom started getting into health food. And so she started getting into organics and I started having to think about healthier foods and organic uh, automatically gets you into organic gardening. You know, how mm -hmm. do you produce this food this way? And so I began to become more and more interested in that. And then what could be done with that, especially as far as I knew I had an interest in growing plants and being involved in always knew I wanted to be uh, in something in my life involved with plants. So I began to take horticulture classes in uh, college just besides what I was studying on my own, you know, just through the years and life experiences and things. Loved libraries. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once when I was in my high school years reading a book about plant roots and that was all it was about, the roots of plants. And the whole book, it was one of the most fascinating books I've ever read in my life. And I just, I thought, yeah, this is where I have to go. This is what I have to do. <laughs> this is my thing, yeah. <laughs> well, in the last 10, 11 years or so, I've been really completely immersed in the cannabis industry because I moved up to where that's the majority of the customers in a garden store where I work. And at the garden store, I basically manage the nursery and take care of the, you know, average uh, typical nursery plants, your ornamentals and your vegetables and that kind of thing. But 90% uh, at least of our customers, uh, e even if they have an ornamental garden, they I have their cannabis garden too. And, you know, most of them aren't necessarily big time growers, but quite a few are quite large scale commercial growers that will still come and they'll trade ideas. And over the years, you know, give their stories of what's worked and what hasn't. And you gain so much just from listening to other people's experiences right. and you don't have to make all these mistakes yourself and you know you find out the cutting edge stuff and you find out well when we found out the russet mites were coming back uh, about five or six years ago um, we hadn't even heard of them before up here 
you know, our worst problems were the two spot mites and the little red uh, spider mites that would come and take over your indoor grow sometimes. Right. But uh, when everybody started hearing about the russet mites, they were panicking because they were they couldn't find anything to kill them. They were using all the forbidden products and they was like, no, no, no. And their stuff was getting tested for, you know, nasty things like forbid and avid, you know, stuff that's really on the label strictly for ornamentals only. You know? Yeah, very, yeah. Very toxic. Yeah, it'll kill the bug, but it might kill you too. But, right. Um, so it was about that same time that I got involved with Dr. Symes because the uh, owner of the nursery where I worked had sold it to uh, her general manager and moved on to sort of retire and you know take care of her mom and her husband who had health problems. And she uh, had a house guest over who had scabies and this house guest left the scabies for the household to enjoy. And she was going through absolute hell trying to get rid of these scabies and uh, trying everything she could find on the market and over the counter and online, everybody's home remedies. And somehow she stumbled across this uh, product, which she now has marketing as Dr. Symes. When she found it, she just was over the moon because she could take a bath in this stuff and it felt really comfortable as opposed to like the cayenne pepper baths and oh, all those yeah. other bleach baths and things that people were recommending for the scabies. It's just a terrible, terrible mite that goes under your skin. And so uh, she got into that and a light bulb started going off because it cured the scabies really quickly. And so she realized, well, with this, does this so gently and easily on my body, wouldn't it maybe work good on the plants and maybe it'll work on the russet mites that we keep hearing about. Okay. Cause you know, it's just a matter of time before they're coming. And sure enough, the, that uh, next growing season, a customer came into me with some leaves to look at and said, tell me what's wrong with my plant. Because they all know, the local growers know that I have a microscope there that I'll look at their stuff, <laughs> yeah. see what I can find, the stuff they can't see with your naked eye. And lo and behold, he definitely was complete. And it was the first time I've seen, uh, he was completely covered with the russet mites. They were on both sides of the leaves, but particularly on the undersides. And it was like, you know, Grand Central Station. It was New York City and rush hour it was crazy we all gasped immediately because you know i have one of these computer microscope hookups where you can see it on the big screen we all looked at it at the same time and then i thought well there's our here's my chance to try out the dr symes on some rest of my yeah <laughs> and just gave him a squirt gave him a really really light squirt and i said well i need to give him just a little second squirt so i gave him a second squirt and they were just they quit moving, okay? And so then we thought, okay, well, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna die or are they gonna come out of it and start crawling around? So we gave them a little time and we noticed they're just not moving anymore and it, nobody's moving. And as time went by, we just, just nobody's moving at all. I think they're dead. And um, come back the next day to find nobody's moving still. Nothing was alive in there. And so that was very, very encouraging. And he went home and he had quite a large commercial grow. He had both indoor and outdoor. And so I did say to him, you know, if you see this on your indoor plants, which is what he had brought in, that you probably have it on your outdoor plants too. And you really need to go look and see and uh, check those leaves because <clears throat> the same thing can be happening. You don't see them. They're so tiny until the damage is just so bad. And the uh, population has gotten so high. But even with that condition, he's just started doing the zyme drenching. And he was one of her first big customers because of the size of his grow and the amount that he needed. He had to get, you know, some 50 gallon barrels of the stuff <laughs> yeah. to really get the problem taken care of. But he did get the problem taken care of and he grows religiously with it. After that, um, he was able to save his crop which uh, is another thing. So I was, of course, doing lots of beta testing for her because I was still working at the nursery while she was thinking that she wanted to start this company with these enzyme or uh, enzymatic type products um, to, uh, to combat these bugs because what we were seeing was that it, it, rather than poisoning them, it sort of slowly dissolves their bodies. So mm -hmm. it's a slow, non-poisonous kill. It's not a super fast kill. And it is a thing where, you know, if the bug hides out and doesn't get hit by the spray, it's not going to hurt them at all, really. But that's why it has to be reapplied, reapplied. But most pesticides do. If you look on the bottles, they all tell you, you know, re reapply every five to seven days or seven right. to ten days, whatever, until the problem's gone. So, you know, they don't all, and none of them assume that, you know, one and done. 
uh, a lot of people kind of think that though when they get to the right prize, it's yeah kind of surprise. you want it to I work applied right it away. And they're still there yeah they're still, <laughs> there. they're still there they will be there for a while I'll keep applying it but so, you know, don't do it in, in such a way that you're going to kill your plant be, so, be uh, responsible with your applications so with our i'd love to jump in then with our first question on sure. um so like I mentioned before, we started recording a lot of our folks in our community, they might be new to growing. And let's just probably assume that they might have like a three by three foot tent or something, some sort of small grow space maybe inside. Um, maybe it's a little bit bigger depending on the person. But what do you recommend for people when they when they start? Because IPM, obviously, it's in the name, Integrated Pest Management. It's a big yes, thing, yes. right? So yes, how, yes. how should someone kind of approach, what's a good approachable way for someone to kind of grok this and to get started? An indoor tent situation, you know, the first thing you want to do, of course, is start clean, make everything as clean as possible and sterilize your walls, sterilize your vents, you know, especially if you've got used equipment that's been handed down by a loving friend who's upgrading, you know, that kind of thing happens a lot. You really, really want to make sure to clean all that stuff thoroughly where anything might be harboring, particularly um, the microscopic stuff, you know, they're really good at hiding. Any kind of uh, debris and things need to be cleaned and powder mildew spores, which can plague us, uh, will just stick around for a long time. They'll go kind of dormant until it, they find a perfect uh, climactic condition and they'll come right back to life again. And uh, oh, here's another thing I want to pass on to people about powder mildew. A lot of people don't realize that uh, powder mildew is one of those somewhat specific kind of uh, illnesses. Okay, so in other words, the powder mildew that affects cannabis there's only two different, there are several types of powder mildew, but two of them attack cannabis, but those two that attack cannabis attack nothing else. Okay, so if you have, if you're growing squash uh, or peppers or whatever, and they have powder mildew, that powder mildew will not move okay. to cannabis. It's a different kind of powder mildew that attacks the squashes and the uh, the peppers and the what have you. Uh, yeah, I have roses in my yard and they get powder right, mildew. Right, so don't worry. Yeah. Uh, their powder mildew is not the same as the cannabis. Kind. That's interesting. Now, so whatever powder mildew you've got from the cannabis, it's come from, you know, it's floating through the air from your neighbors down right. the road or what have you. Um, it can live for a long time and float for a long time. It can travel on other animals and, you know, et cetera. It's very durable stuff. But um, it is specific. So, I mean, a lot of people were worried that they, oh, my squash got, and so now I've, and no, it didn't work that way. That was the whole different type of powder mildew. Right. There really are quite a few different types. And some like it uh, hot, some like it cold, some like it wet, some like it dry. So you can't necessarily assume it's always the same condition that will trigger them either. So it's another issue with powder mildew in the world. But <laughs> Right. So it sounds like you're, we should start by cleaning our space and making sure Very that's much. clean. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say, um, I don't know, I don't want to assume too much about growth styles because, of course, there's a billion different growth styles. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe a good way, another thing to kind of mention in this in, in this area, um, and now there's helicopters flying over my house. Uh, <laughs> so there's probably something interesting going on. Um, uh <laughs> You know, so a home grower, um, when they're approaching um, integrated pest management with in their kind of their their first starting out, maybe they've got seeds or clones. Um, what do you suggest for that? Um, I'm sure there's a, a whole bunch of great IPM suggestions for clones in particular, especially mm -hmm. I was literally just at a dispensary in this particular dispensary. They have, they had a bunch of plants in there today and I've been there in the past. And sometimes those plants look so sad. <laughs> and, oh, I've you, know seen them. I, you know what I mean? And you also, you they're right next to the front door. <laughs> Yeah, they're right next to the front door as well. So you don't know like what's coming in. So what's maybe you could speak on? to that about why yeah. some of these things that I'm mentioning are even important, you know? Yeah, because they are so little, especially when they travel to tiny things. You know, what I like to do is I do use the Dr. Symes on the little uh, clone things, but I use a very tender amount. I use like one ounce per gallon of water. So it's really very diluted when they're very young in that stage. You don't need anything strong, but what you're doing there is basically harassing anything that might possibly want to get started, any kind of nasty sorts of molds and mildews or 
you know, suppose there was this errant little freaking <laughs> russet mite that was still there, someone cutting of the clone, you know, sometimes they are. And, you know, they just start reproducing so quickly. Next thing you know, you've got a tray of things that are a foot tall and covered with russet mites. And you can't totally. Fly it. Or spider mites it's or just, whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's a very sad day because, yeah. you know, even the more common mites are microscopic when they're young. It's My friend gave me a adults. pepper plant last year and the pepper plant, I think, had some sort of like white flies mm. on it or something like that. Oh, I believe you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it just can happen from any which direction. And even if it comes well, here, in the form of a gift, <laughs> along exactly. with a gift, you know. <laughs> exactly. And I've seen the electron microscope pictures of a white fly. So you know how small a white fly is. And it had broad mites all over it, hanging on like a little kid with, you know, hanging onto his dad's legs. Where the, this is how they travel from plant to plant. It's they're lightweight enough. And the, and the uh, white fly is bigger enough <laughs> that it can just, it picks them up like a bus and moves them to the, another plant somewhere. And it's such a small thing. It's so easy to miss as it can get into any space like that. Right. So that's why we constantly preach preventative maintenance this is going to be your best friend and that's the thing people have the hardest time wrapping their head around because that means spending money on a problem you might not have right but here's the way what you what you're doing is spending money to prevent that problem ever occurring because normally if you're doing regular preventative at least once or twice a week depends on you know how bad you your situation might be Sometimes you have a past history where you know you've got to be extra vigilant and sometimes you don't so you know you don't have to go full bore if you know you don't have a situation but um preventative just uh keeps the problem from ever happening i know uh growers who will be real good about that for a while then they'll go you know i haven't had any problems at all i'm just going to shine it for a while and next thing you know they're infested and sure enough it's just like well we could have told you that was gonna happen and you know yeah it right. does make such a difference to be preventative so regardless whether you're using doctor's arms or whatever prevention 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 so what is that let's break that down a little bit so if we have um a great enzymatic um foliar spray or, or whatever what have you like a like a doctor's arms um mm -hmm. We should be using that. It sounds like from the get go, it's good to just yes. I clean it, yes. you know, clean your space, clean your clones or what, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then we've let's say we've got them growing. They've been growing for, uh, you know, they, we've grown them from seed. They're a couple of weeks old or whatever. Are we starting? Are we foliar spraying them like once I a would week be, with but, this or something? But, but with a very gentle solution, not with yeah. the full strength or even a half strength, but more like a quarter strength solution. Um, but just to get them started getting used to the process. Well, what I have done in the past, because I always recommend if you're getting new things in, you want to quarantine them for sure. And you want to spray them thoroughly to make sure they don't have any issues they're going to bring into the rest of your garden. So with that, I have definitely overdosed them before. I have given them a strong spray and just drenched them. And the next day I'll come back and find, oh my gosh, the leaves have all curled up. They're going to fall off. They're going to die. Yeah. And I thought, oh my Lord, what have I done? <laughs> but lo and behold, you know, in just a couple of days, those new leaves start popping out and they're all beautiful and clean. And then, you know, then this plant's going to be okay. Don't panic. It's all going to come back and it's going to come back clean. Because if there was anything there, you're definitely not that puppy out <laughs> right with that but um i don't recommend doing that as a rule that that's normally an accident but uh i do recommend doing like a quarter strength and that and i have practiced that and not seen the plants show any sign of stress and i've stayed ahead of you know, whatever i have seen you know sometimes i'm going around the garden i was like, oh my lord aphid you know how they just suddenly appear oh totally yeah. and they're all like, covering the branch so yeah why you do that so fast but uh, and there's they match the color of the plant, so they're not that easy to see, especially if you're old like me with your eyes are just not what they <laughs> no. used to be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're that too. And uh, you know, we're not all spring chickens, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, yeah, it is hard. But that stuff, I'll whip out the Dr. Symes, I can kill them pretty much right away. Those kind so of pests, it's easy for. That's its specialty. It's the small sucking insects, the soft body. Soft, the softer the body, the better. That's the part of the uh, key to prevention is that you're killing them then on their larval stage where they're the most tender rather than letting them get to the adult stage where they're a lot tougher. They get a tougher skin as they grow. 
they secrete waxy coatings on their bodies and their eggs are covered with waxy coatings. So they, it's harder to uh, kill the eggs. It's harder to get something to stick to the egg because of that coating. That's the part of their protection, of course. You know, they're kind of so to that point, um, mm-hmm. what is the spray frequency to kind of disrupt that reproduction cycle or, or whatever? What have you? Well, that's why we recommend the weekly because these little critters reproduce so quickly. You know, once they get of age, it's usually less than a week before they begin to reproduce. They're already laying eggs, you know, less than a week after they're born. <laughs> and yeah. depending on which species, they may lay a few eggs a day or a few yeah. hundred eggs a day. But God help you. But, you know, that adds up so quickly, you know. With yeah, the, totally. Do the math. And it's very scary in a short time what you can come back to if you had to leave town at the wrong time which has happened if you have i've i've heard i feel like i've heard and and um with other uh sprays or whatever you if you have like an infestation that you maybe spray Mm -hmm. once and then again in a few days later to help Uh kind of you you have like one is maybe like a knockdown so to speak and then the next one might be to like kill any things do you have any Any suggestions in that situation like or yeah how do you approach that a lot of people that Dr. Uh, Zimes have tried and recommended is uh, three day in a row when you first see an infestation where you first realize, oh my God, I've got a problem. Then you, they hit it three days in a row consecutively with a full strength of four ounces per gallon. That's as strong as you would ever use for cannabis. You never want to exceed four ounces per gallon on cannabis. It's too tender for anything stronger. And so you, we would hit it like that three days in a row. And that way you've just knocked huge part of the population down after that you give the plant a little bit of a break and a uh, chance to recover from just spraying is stressful just like you know getting oh, medical totally. surgery is stressful when you have a serious problem sometimes you have to do stressful things to fix it so you want to give your plant a little chance to uh, stand up and and recover from that but you don't want to stop because in a few days you're going to want to look at your leaves and see how the population is you know, and then decide, do I need to keep hitting it at four ounces a gallon? Do I need to do another three day in a row thing? Or can I go to every other day or every couple of days or maybe twice a week? Just depending on what you see in the population. That's it. You've got to have those out here for a new grower. You've got to have one of those little monitoring uh, loops, they call them, uh, a handheld yeah. microscope where you can easily go to your plants and see the things that your naked eye can't see, those little tiny russet mites are identifiable. And the yeah. broad mites. And, and the, underneath the leaves is the big spots. thing. Yes. They're always the underneath. Main place. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> the main place. Yeah, yeah, that's their favorite hiding spot. And where the good veins are that they like to latch into and start taking all your plant juices out. Yeah, that's so what makes them so hard to happens. see is because they kind of hide in those nooks and crannies, you know? Right. And and especially with a new grower, they'll start noticing something wrong with their plant, but they'll think maybe it's a nutrient problem because it looks like a nutrient problem. And in a way, it is a nutrient problem because the, the bugs are stealing your nutrients. But what's ha- you, you know, they're trying to adjust their nutrients without doing any spraying for bugs. And meanwhile, those bug populations just growing, growing, growing. And when I say bugs, that's an incorrect term, but, you know, I'm not being proper as an as <laughs> etymolo- entomologist would be. Right. <laughs> but uh, little critters, you know, those pesty pesty mites, um, they, they're tough. They're going to fight back and they're going to find strategies. And that's why we like to do a lot of things. I like to spray. And then I, after I spray and the spray dries, I like to put out uh, predator insects. To, you know, give them a chance to walk around and if you haven't sprayed them, they're not going to be bothered. They'll walk around and get the guys you missed and get quite a few of those. And they'll have, you know, especially if you're doing a maintenance thing and are not in the middle of an infestation. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you just put these things out to make sure that everything stays very clean. How can I, I'd love to drill into that because I I've spent um, lots of money on bugs uh, cause I grow, oh, I grow, yeah. yeah, they're in, they're, they're not cheap, especially for a home grower. Yeah. Cause most of these bugs, you need to overnight ship them. So that oh, adds like right. another 30, it's 50 huge. bucks in shipping. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I would love to kind of, um, take a side track here and, and talk about bugs real mm-hmm. quick. So, um, predator insects first, let's, well, I would love to, introduce that concept to f- in folks that are watching that might not know what that means and then secondly i'd love to hear um 
if there were a top one or two or three or whatever predator bugs that you think f folks are it's, it's mm -hmm. worth buying you know whether it's for your soil or their canopy or whatever it is right uh nematodes i want to send right off the bat for your soil that's one of the best things to start soil drenching with right away and then you can prevent most all soil pests with uh, just predator nematodes um, you can also spray them foliarly, but I don't really like to do that for a couple of reasons. If you do spray them foliar, it has to be constant humidity, like they'll dry up and die, really, if you don't have a really, really wet environment on the leaves. And I'd rather do the Dr. Symes on the leaves, and I don't want to be killing off the nematodes that I spent a fortune on, right, <laughs> because yeah. I'd rather save the nematodes for the soil and the Dr. Symes for the canopy. And that way I get a lot of the best success. Now, if it seems like I'm having an issue in the soil and I've put nematodes in, obviously the nematodes are warned up to the task or they've died off or they, they didn't have a, a food source when I needed them, you know, or whatever. Uh, they've gone, you know, to the next hinterlands. But, you know, then I'll go ahead and do a soil drench with Dr. Symes, get rid of the problem. And when I think that problem is cleared up, I'll go back and get me some more nematodes and drench the soil with the nematodes again and try to get that population happy. And usually if you can get, you know, a biological grow going, and when I say biological grow, I'm talking about people who are growing with microbes rather than in a sterile way that pretty much kills microbes, you know, with the pure salt uh, kind right. of grow things, the, the typical uh, hydroponic situation is a uh, pure salt situation. But People who are growing organics are trying to cultivate bacteria and fungi to be the workers and to provide the foods for the plant. So if you're growing that way, which is how I like to do it, I, you know, I will be always adding things to my water when I'm watering, such as uh, humic acids and uh, compost tea. A um, little bit of soluble seaweed powder is one of the most excellent ways to get good uh, source of potassium and other trace minerals that are in uh, the kelp and such, that in a really plant available, really fast acting formula. Soluble seaweed powder is one of those things, boy, the more people catch on to that, <laughs> the harder it is to find it because it really <laughs> works good. It really is great stuff. We actually had two questions um, from, uh, they were, uh, two people asked a question. Bread for the North was the name and then Kendall 420. They both asked, how does Dr. Zymes affect the microbiology in my soil when I soil, soil, sorry, when I drench? So when you are drenching the soil, how much are you kind of disrupting that ecosystem that you just talked about, you know, wanting to create? And then how do we oh, you know, rectify that? Oh, yeah. I have a fabulous story for this one. This is something that I, I learned by accident. It kind of blew my mind. I had a, you know, I, I had a situation where it, I was making my compost tea, as I like to do. And then just before I'm going to put this out with my plants at the nursery, it goes, it's in a barrel where I'll put in just a little dash of some super organic fertilizer, which is basically kelp, ocean fish, and uh, molasses, a little tad of that. And that really gets the biology excited, you know, just when you're going to put it out on the plants. So I had this all ready to go. And it takes me about three days to get through this whole 50 gallon barrel with all the things you know after the dilution process going out to the plant so I have always an air thing going on in there keeping the air rated so nothing's going to go anaerobic on me while this whole, whole uh, barrel is waiting to be used up so anyway I had went home for the night it's a hot summer day the power had gone off when nobody was there and I didn't know about it so needless to say this stuff with that extra special fertilization went real nasty real fast with no air going in it and I came to see my whole 50 gallon barrel was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? This stuff is full of the worst sorts of uh, things that I don't wanna put in my soil because you can see what grows in a low oxygen condition. It's not what you wanna put out. So I thought, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? So I remembered, okay, when the bacteria dies, that's when they release their nutrients. And I know from doing experiments before with Dr. Symes, if I put, the, put it on the bacteria, they all died right away. I thought, oh, what a bummer for my bacteria. But in this case, I was going to say, you know what? It might be my only hope. I can kill the bacteria, release the nutrients, and still at least have some fertile water to put on my plants that won't be toxic waste. <laughs> so I said, hail Mary, full of grace. I poured some Dr. Symes into the thing. It was probably like a half a gallon or so of Dr. Symes into the 50-gallon barrel of mm. 
putrefying stuff is, you know, now I had power and air back and things started going. And when you agitate Dr. Science, it foams like crazy. So it was just born foam for a couple of days. And that was interesting and all, but I said, you know, I'm figuring I killed the bacteria because I looked under the microscope. I went ahead and put it out on the plants. The plants all responded favorably. I wasn't perturbed about that. A couple of days later, I was about to put out the last of it with that, you know, I tell you it takes three days to go through it. So the third day when I looked at it again, I went, oh my God, the biology had rebounded just so fantastically. And it was all the good guys and not the bad guys. So I went, okay, this tells me that it will knock them back quite a bit, but they rebound so quickly. And even, you know, I didn't clean the thing out. I didn't change it, the water. I didn't rinse away the zyme. You know, whatever was in there was still in there in in whatever form, but they had gotten to the point where the good biology had come back, but I wasn't seeing the bad guys huh. who had definitely taken over before I put it in. It's like it gave, um, gave it them space. Thriving. Yeah, it did. It really was amazing. It's like, okay, so it is not a residual problem in the soil. So I know if I'm having a living soil and I have to go through and do some big drench like that, where I have to knock out a terrible problem, it will come back really quickly. And I don't have to stress about that. That was Interesting. very relieving to me. <laughs> um, I've had to do it a couple of times since then. And now that I know how it works, I'm not as nervous about it. But, if, you know, actually, right. I prefer to do things the normal way. But in a pinch, uh, you can actually do that. If I were to to go back to bugs for a second, if I was, uh -huh. um, and again, I guess to, to touch on predator insects. So we're we're talking about the good bugs that eat the bad bugs, essentially. Right. Uh, and yeah. so um, I love um, adding, um, I forget what the name is, the scientific name, but the little tiny white soil mite that like eats uh, yeah. fungus gnats and stuff like that. Um, that's one of my favorites. I think it's a hypoaspis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About. They're not, they gave it a better name now. Yeah. I, <laughs> hype, uh, oh God. Hypo smiley. Uh, strati stratio laylapsis. Yeah, stratio laylapsis or something. Terrible yeah. names, but yeah, I know what you mean. They like to live in the top half inch of soil and they're very good at surviving Dr. Symes. Not only are they bigger and tougher and faster, they are good at hiding in there. Their whole thing is they're running around looking for prey. They're not latching onto one spot waiting for a spray to come hit them. You know, they really, uh, yeah. we have growers who use those and they have said, well, you know, it might knock them down a little bit, kind of like I said with the bacteria, but it doesn't wipe them out at all. They they use both the Dr. Simes and the stratiolalaps, the little mites, the yeah. soil dwelling mites. And they're really good for keeping uh, down those things like the thrips and the uh, fungus gnat larvae that, you know, fungus gnat larva likes to uh, hatch right on the soil. It likes the fungus gnats fly up in the air and drop their little eggs on the soil. They love organic soil. So that's where organic soil has a problem. And, in, and if your organic soil comes with fungus gnat eggs already, <laughs> the uh, makers of the organic soil say that's your problem because that's organic soil and that's the way organic <laughs> soil is. And so they don't, they give you no mercy there. So what you have to do really, you know, if you don't want to spend all your money drenching your soil is to just get a layer of sand. Play sand is the best because it's, clean it has no salts in it like the seashore sand might have too many salts for your plants but uh play sand you can easily get it at a hardware store you know any kind of landscape supply place it comes in with plastic bags for you to put in your backyard sand pile and it's excellent for just you put a couple inches of that on the top of the plant and it dries really really super fast on top and when and when those uh, fungus gnat larvae lay their eggs on it they just dry up and die and you can break the life cycle that way. And then you don't have to waste your Dr. Symes on fungus gnat larvae. You can save that for, you You know, the things that it's really going to save you is the mites. And the mites and the thrips and the, that sort of thing, they get so <clears throat> on the leaves. Are there, so um, we had a question about flower and I have, I could talk about 
IPM and flower for ages because I have so many right. questions, but because uh, it's such a challenge, right? You don't want to, yep. typically, you don't want to spray much in flower. Um, right. And so, you know, especially when I'm growing outdoor, I'm just like praying. Yep. I've just spent all this summer, you know, growing these giant yep. plants. And now we're in the last six weeks and I'm just getting eaten alive by yeah. last year was caterpillars just kicked my ass. Uh... Uh, yeah. Um, yes. and so I had a question about that later, but, um, anyways, how should we approach IPM and flower? That's a great place to start. How should we, how can we, I guess, go into flower and, and be, you know, at our best and then, and then get through flower. Right. Well, if you've been doing the preventative all the way, you probably won't have pests during flower, but with Dr. Zymes, you are safe to spray during flower. And we have done this ever since we've done experiments with it and uh, seen it save people. And I've seen flowers come in completely covered with recent mites and they are eating away the trichomes, they're eating away the pistols, they're eating everything. And it's just amazing. They uh, don't get stuck in the trichomes because they slip right between them. They're so tiny. Unlike uh, your little predator mites and things will get stuck in those sticky trichomes and they'll, they will not be able to do the job. And so you can use the Dr. Science for that purpose. And it has been the thing that has saved some people in the end. I, I know a lot of people are incredibly nervous about the concept. They just can't fathom the thought that you would put a thing on that can kill bugs and then consume this plant. They can't wrap their head around it. I'm, it's kind of like eating food. It's really not a dangerous product. And uh, so there is a lot of fear and it's hard. Some people just can't cross that barrier. Yeah. You, know, they'll, you can't convince them that this is not a toxic product to, for the consumer. Or and, they're afraid that they'll and, lose terpenes or THC content. It, or something oh, there's like that. that too. Well, yeah. there, a lot of people have sprayed too strong of a mix. They used to have really a lot more confusing instructions. I think they've changed their instructions now. They're not quite so confusing on the bottle. So people were accidentally really overdosing sometimes. And that would, you know, cause the little, uh, what you would call white hairs to go brown. And people were like, what, what, what? And it, that would be very nerve wracking. You know, that isn't the terpenes, it's not the, the trichomes, but it's still, it was scary. Right. And it didn't look good. And it what it doesn't happen if you get the, the mix ratio right. Like I say, don't go over a quarter, uh, four ounces per gallon. And I do tell people to adjust their pH after they've mixed and before you apply it to the plant, because that's when it really matters. Your plant wants a pH of about six to seven. Okay. And it doesn't want a pH that's way higher. Uh, Dr. Symes in particular is a very acidic product. So I suppose your water is also acidic and you mix the two to get a real acidic mix. It might be too much, right. too strong. And you or, might you know, burn the, the tips opposite. Or you just don't know where. Yeah, if your water is very alkaline or yeah. you know, RO water, it can be all over the place. So you, you really do have to check it after because what it really matters is when it's hitting your plant. That's when you want your optimum pH to be it's between six and seven and you want your temperature if you're using Dr. Zymes to be 90 degrees because it's uh, optimal for the active ingredients. Now, obviously it's not going to stay 90 degrees. If you're spraying it on there, it's going to be 90 degrees for about a minute, a second. Even. You know, it's just that you want that warmth. It's going to help the product work better. Okay. But it's not going to stay hot on the plant for any length of time. So you don't need to worry about, oh my God, 90 degrees. Really? That's just like mild bath water. That's not that hot. So am I, yeah. so I'm spraying, um, you know, I could be spraying something like Dr. Zymes once a week. It sounds like mm -hmm. through flower. Is there a harvest? I think it's harvest interval is the term, right? The, the amount of days mm -hmm. that I need to wait till right. harvest. Correct. Well, there is not with Dr. Zymes. And in fact, a lot of people do use it as a, as a wash afterwards, as right. a bud wash, with the high praise being given to it as well. And commercial growers who get tested, and they, it leaves no residue. They're not getting uh, any points off for residue. And so uh, they're really, really happy with it. And I say there's people who have written them letters just heartfelt saying, you saved my crop. And it's just, it's really nice to hear feedback like that. Um, right. It, safe and sane and it does the job you do have to be persistent with it and like i say be responsible with it you know don't overdose with it um 
we don't want to get overzealous. It's, you know, we often do with our plant care. <laughs> right. We want to feed too much or water too much or something too much. <laughs> I know it's hard to resist those urges. Totally. Yeah. It always just seems like if you do more of something, you'll get more weed out of it or something. <laughs> yeah. Or we in our mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, Next up, we heard from a community member, Big E, and they had a question about starting seeds. So I know we're kind of mm. taking a detour here. Um, so they said they asked a question about, uh, let's see, they said, when sprouting seeds, is it okay to inoculate with a microbial product or a mycorrhizae? And what about, and then they asked about, you know, what about them adding worm castings or compost or seaweed or kelp? Like, should they be doing these things for, I guess, sprouting seeds? And are there pros, cons, or benefits to that? One of the favorite old things to do with seed sprouting is to get a diluted mix of kelp, you know, some kind of, uh, it doesn't have to be soluble seaweed, by the way. With that, you can use some kind of liquid kelp and just, you know, very diluted, soak your seeds in it till they uh, sprout. We've gotten fantastic luck with that before. I also like to use Dr. Syme sometimes on the canvas just to make sure that I'm not going to have any trace of uh, some fungus, mold, mildew, what have you, that might have been lurking unbeknownst. Right. You know, it's really just kind of a, another preventative thing. And you use so little, it's not like it's going to cost me a bunch of money to add a shot glass of that to my water, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. And soak everything. And so I feel like I'm just covering all my bases the best I can. But I do like, uh, with the kelp, you get just those ever so slight trace minerals so that if something sprouts you will have the slightest amount of nutrient without any chance of a burn going on which is uh, one of the things that uh, I've noticed new growers will sometimes do is try to feed too soon eating totally. too soon will kill your little baby it'll be like a one. little tiny little cotyledon yeah. you know seedling and they'll start feeding it yeah 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 you've got to at least have those first sets of leaves and then even when you do start feeding you need to feed real 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 slightly real lightly until the plant gets a little bit of size on it to handle all that like i told somebody the other day you know first they start off with just milk and nothing else then they go to hamburgers okay eventually <laughs> But totally done a straight transition. They got to take little steps along the way. Yeah, I find I just, you know, seedlings are really delicate, and I've Very. had I've killed a lot of seedlings to be or seeds it's to be honest to with do. you. Yeah, oh, but yes. if you're really careful and you just kind of give them that space and you make sure that they have um, that they don't get totally dried out, and also that they're not sopping wet and creating like a yes. space for fungus gnats or something nasty. As long as you have, you know, you're able to find that happy medium and just kind of leave them alone, they can get through, mm -hmm. you know, the first week or two or so. They have kind yeah. of what they need, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like I say, they are at their most delicate and vulnerable stage then. And, you know, they can be seeming fine and what you're walking at it's just falling over dead. And what do they do wrong? <laughs> exactly. It's usually something involving too much love. Just a hair over the line is all it takes oh, totally. in that state. So, you know, forgive yourself if this happens. And that's why we try to sprout more than we need just to you know, make sure things. And especially if you don't know if it's feminized, you always want to sprout more than you need because you're going to have to probably take some males out unless you're trying to grow for seeds. And even then you want to limit the number of males that you have. And so uh, overplanting is good. You don't know if everybody's going to make it to adulthood quote unquote or you know, totally it goes, it, things can go wrong it's good to have some backup i agree i'm actually i was just just about to sprout seeds and i'm definitely gonna have to have those backups because <laughs> you never know what your luck is i've had bad luck where i've sprouted like six seeds and five of them are males <laughs> or four of them um, or something you know what i mean yeah sometimes <laughs> sometimes boy um well we have a, a last few questions that we can um, get through and then I might uh, have an, have another one that I might bring up for myself <laughs> um, okay uh, while I have you here but um so let's see we had a couple questions that revolved around um, kind of harvesting and 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 potency and mm. things like that uh, with the folks that would love your tips so um, we had a question from Colton Canabridge uh, he asked for your harvest tips and tricks they said, Aside from the twist and snap method, which to kind of 
Oh, Edit- ed- editorials mean. note, but for our listeners, <laughs> you're drying your cannabis. It, the kind of the twist and snap method is basically you cut down your plant, you dry it in a drying space, maybe like your grow tent or something like that without the lights on. You dry it in your tent, and then you know it's ready to uh, cure when you can snap off a branch. That's what's the to kind of take a side step. That's what well, that's what he's referring to the twist and snap method. Mm-hmm. Are there other good ways to know when you're done drying and ready to move to cure besides that method that you know of? Um, I'm religious about the snapping, but I make sure that it's at the point of the branch where the thickness is uh, like a number two pencil. It's important not to snap just anywhere. You want that kind branches. of thickness because, yeah. yeah, that's a judge of the amount of moisture in the buds. And that's what the issue is because sometimes your buds will seem really dry on the outside, but you go to trim them up and you, and you put them in the jar and you realize, oh, my God, they were really moist inside. They were not ready at all yet. And so with if you can snap the bud at the pencil, I'm not the bud, the branch at the pencil thickness, and you get that nice snap, clean break. And you're, then it's time to uh, take them off of the branches and, and do the rest of the process. What I like to do when I'm, I like to go real slow and real cool. You want to, I like to dry them real s- the slowest that I possibly can. So I'll, I keep the temperatures low and the fans running. So I'm not going to have mold and things growing. And uh, I'll let them, I'll hang my whole uh, plant unless it's too big to do that. But so far I've most of my plants aren't too big to do that. And I'll hang the whole plant upside down and just let it go that way. And at that point, of course, as it's drying, you can take the big leaves off, take off all the big leaves that you want, but leave the actual buds on the branch until you can get that snap at the pencil point. That really is your best judge of the moisture inside of your buds. And that way you will have uh, less issue when you go to, you know, hopefully you're putting them in jars at the end because that's the best way to store things but, you know, with jars, you've got to do the burp, burp, burping, but you won't have near as much to do if you don't have moist buds. And sometimes you'll find, whoops, I accidentally overdried. Right. Because, you know, some, I rely on the certain amount of humidity when I'm, I do an outdoor grow in autumn. I assume that the air is going to have a certain amount of humidity because rain usually starts then. Right. And last year in particular, we had such a dry, hot autumn. Yeah. It was like, oh, my things dried too fast, you know. And then you yeah. got to get a little more humidity into your situation. And, and people are very surprised by what? You're adding humidity and you're trying to dry. <laughs> you don't <laughs> want to dry fast. Fast driving buds is ruining them. A lot of new growers are not aware yet that if you, and they, oh my God, one customer I remember, he, was trying so hard to do everything right and asking questions and taking notes. And really when it came to the end and he hung up his harvest, he had no idea about a slow dry. He uh, dried everything really pretty fast in a hot room. And when the buyer came in to look at his plants, it just, you know, you touch them and they crumble. And yeah. it was just, mm, sorry, can't help you. Uh, lost everything. And, and it's so, not going to have the smell that you want it to have. No, it's just not going to have any of that. Every, the yeah. flavor, yeah. Now, if it gets a little bit too dry, you can rehydrate it with various things. A boveda works good, but you know the good old piece of tortilla works good too. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the right amount of moisture. But you do you have to pay attention if you're going to do that. You know, take a piece of tortilla and put it in a jar with your kind of over dried weed and you go back in a couple hours and check that moisture level you go back in a couple more hours and check it you know until you until it's where you want it because it works fairly quickly and you know like if you accidentally forget and left it in there for a couple of days it might mold so you don't want oh, that's to have good that to happen yeah you don't yeah. want so that tortillas aren't yeah. like uh cheap bovita packs is what you're telling me no 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 <laughs> but they are the, the cheap cure for you know it, for, it's not a thing you can leave in the jar like a bovita yes you can right. leave it in the jar but i've heard some people complain that they didn't like the way that made it taste so i don't know you know that that might yeah. be just a personal thing some people just, yeah it's uh, tough to tell with those mental. sorts of things yeah yeah that story i really couldn't tell you but i know that little uh things you can add for moistness for not in an emergency but pay attention don't leave them in there a long time yeah i love um the amber mason jars that you can get you can yes. they, they they're hard to find in stores like you might have to and order keep them, them online. in the dark yeah you want to store these things in the dark and in the cool dark if you can because the cooler the darker the longer it's going to last and really you get your best bud after it's been in that jar in the dark for a couple of months two or three months 
Right. And after that, it will begin to deteriorate a little. But I mean, I've had stuff in the jar for a couple of years, and you can still get high on it, but it just it loses quite a bit of <laughs> after right. time. Right. There's some sort of it's, period of time where it kind of crests. Yeah, it begins to degrade. Yeah. 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 Um, well, b- building off of that, we had um, a question from Matt. Uh, his name is uh, Beer Can Grow Challenge. And they mm-hmm. asked if you have any other tips for maximizing potency. Oh, well, you know, That's I a really big one. like the idea of intercropping with uh, things with high terpenes that you like to, you know, increase the terroir effect of having the high terpene things around your plant to increase its terpenes and therefore increasing. And also the soluble seaweed powder is a really good way of getting that potassium with the extra oils that give you the extra density and the extra, you know, uh, high uh, resins that we like, but uh, just planting, you know, intercropping with lavenders and rosemaries and eucalyptus and things with those beautiful, strong terpene smells, the citruses and the, uh, stuff like that it will make a difference i i don't know how strong you know how measurable it is but it's all those little things that add up eventually do they need to share the same soil or can i have like them in separate pots just just the same space just the same space you know think of all those great people when they're telling you oh this wine was grown in 90s and blah 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 they know because you know, the the uh, nearby was the field of whatever. You know, right, <laughs> yeah, there was the, a flood that year. Blah blah. They, you know, it affects the flavor of everything. It's kind of weird, you know, especially in an organic grow. You know, but the problem yeah. with the with the really salty grow is that usually you lack flavor. That's the thing that people have a hard time incorporating flavor into a hydroponic kind of a grow. So they'll buy things like the sweet, you know, the sugary stick to try to get yeah, some totally. flavor into their buds. The terp the juice or whatever. Mm-hmm. They all have funny yeah. names. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're out in the soil, though, you don't usually need to do that as much or, or even indoors in the soil. But, you know, an indoor hydroponic situation can be a little tasteless if you don't make an extra effort to get some flavor in there. You can do organics in a hydroponic situation, but you have to really be on the cleaning and you got to clean a lot more because things will get into crevices and start becoming the wrong bacteria. There goes everything. Totally. Um, Yeah. Let's see. We have um, last community question, and then I'll ask my question. Um, So uh, Benny B. Blazin asked, what types of products should not be used alongside Dr. Zymes? Ah, well, you know what? It doesn't mix really good with, you know, oils and things. I mean, what happens is a lot of times people will be using an oil-based uh, product because that's most of what's on the market. And then they'll want to go in right away with the Dr. Symes afterwards. And I say, nah, give it seven to 10 days for those oils to dissipate because otherwise the Dr. Symes are going to be wasting so much time trying to clean the oils off. It's going to miss, uh, you know, the energy it could be putting into killing the bugs and you won't be as happy with it. And uh, the other thing that I would always tell people is if you are using oil-based pesticides or anything in your garden to at least put uh, 30 days between them and any sort of sulfur products that you might want to use because sulfurs and oils, well, uh, some people put an even bigger break between them and some people put a smaller break. So there's a little controversy in that break period, but sulfurs and oils, you definitely don't want to mix them anywhere near each other. Um, so if you're going to rotate, try to do something, you know, with uh, something else in the middle that is not a potentially problem product. And I know with the Dr. Symes that you don't want to add anything that is a high oxygenating thing. Like you don't want to mix it with hydrogen peroxide. That would be too much oxidation, I think. Um, you don't want to mix your things like Dr. Symes with your fertilizer at the same time that you're putting it on. A lot of people get confused by that because they'll think, what? You mean I can't use them together? Well, what can I? No, you can, of course, feed and fertilize normally, but you don't put them in the same mixer bottle at the same time and spray them out. Because right. Things can happen when you mix chemicals and they can alter stuff and ruin things. And whereas if you just put them out separately and they hit the ground and the plant separately, they, you know, get assimilated separately and they, you know, they're taken care of and without the one interfering with the other. Right. So usually if you're going to put on Dr. Sun, just put it on by itself. Or, you know, if you're going to rotate, maybe rotate with insects or 
uh, if you're going to do uh, that and the oil-based things, you know, put them, put your oil-based things after the zymes and then put maybe your insects after that and then maybe after that do your zymes again, you know, do that kind of a rotation so that you're not getting uh, the doctor's zymes wasting its time with the oils so much. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, to get yeah. more effectiveness out of a rotation. Totally. If, uh, well, great. And I, well, my last, the last question is one that I kind of referred to earlier and it's kind of a selfish one, but I've noticed that a lot of people had the <laughs> same issue, which was caterpillars, at least here in Northern California oh, seem to yes. really, and you know, the most, the, what makes it so freaking personal is of course they pick some of the biggest buds that they can possibly oh, find, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And so I just take these awesome pictures and then a few do days later, those pictures are going to look different because that big uh, cola is no longer going to be there anymore. So mm -hmm. how can I um, make sure that my outdoor crops get through to harvest? How can I defend myself against caterpillars? Caterpillars, that's one of the hardest ones. Now, if you know that you have those kind of caterpillars, you know, the easy kind of caterpillars are the ones that just hang out on the edges of leaves. So you can spray those with Dr. Zymes and they just drop dead. But the other kind of caterpillars that lay their eggs in the little buds and they're crawling out of the buds and crawling out of the stems sometimes if it's a different kind of caterpillar. Yeah. Those are terrible because you really can't spray those. You can't get to them with the spray. So really, your only protection is you have to be on constant vigilance. So there's no other way except netting and uh, bug sappers. You really have to invest in that if caterpillars are an issue. And it's like, wow, you mean really I got to net every plant? Well, if you want to save it, you do. Because, geez, there's no other way to keep those uh, little, you know, because the cat uh, the caterpillars, they come from the butterflies and the moths uh, that are just fly by here and there. They don't yeah. come as like a swarm that you can... You know, you could attack that flying insect and kill it with the spray or whatever, but you'd have to stand there all day, like, you know, and watch for them to come. It's just that they, right. they just come here and they come there, you know, but one of them will sit and lay 20 eggs. And you're just like, what? Oh, my goodness. You've got problems. And when they when they start up emerging from the bud, they've already been in there eating and shitting and eating and shitting. And then your butt smells Bud rot. Shit. Yeah, and, it's terrible. Oh, God. And then botrytis starts. And yeah, I bet you really, really have to invest in bug zappers and netting for that situation. So are the real moths hyper vigilant. And, are the moths and the butterflies that are laying these caterpillars? And I thought it was at least it's moths, I think, in particular that are laying these particular caterpillars. Yeah. yeah. Are they doing that? Because I've been told, you know, I went to the grow store. I did every the classic grower thing go to the grocery store and ask the guy what the fuck <laughs> what the fuck do i do and um you know what they suggested is well you just need to spray like towards the end of veg um you know out in outdoor season here in north america here in california in particular you know i need to spray june july make sure i'm good in july and then by august and whatnot i can be fine because they were gonna say, basically saying like hey the caterpillars are getting there from these bugs earlier in the summer they're because i guess i was i was spraying things like grandivo i've sprayed mm. other things um that you can spray and flower but that i felt like i was kind of i obviously didn't work because i still got hit super hard no. with caterpillars so it felt like i was like yeah. missing the window well, yeah, and you got to think about what's happening there because, you know, you may be getting some uh, microscopic things with the Grand Evo and stuff, but the the cat, the moths that are flying around, they aren't getting hit by it at all. They're not right. being bothered by it. They're still just flying in, dropping some egg, flying away. They know that the best place their eggs to survive is right there on your foot. Best looking flower. Right. All the food they need is right there. So that's where they lay their eggs and they're gone. And if you didn't catch that moth when it came in, you probably aren't going to catch those eggs, you know, and it's just, it's such a hard battle. There's really nothing you can spray for that kind of situation. Interesting. The only kind of preventative thing I can get, like I say, I've, if it's the caterpillars that you can see that are on right. the leaves that are chewing the leaves off, which is a different kind of caterpillar, I can kill those easily with the doctor's arms. But with the things, if they're hidden inside the flower buds, good God help you. Yeah, because, you know, you literally would have buds. to go dunk every single bud, you know, and that's yeah. what if they are laying their eggs there because they know 
they have the best chance of survival there. <laughs> yeah, because what That's they do is they strategy. they get they'll find a bud and then they'll go in towards the center towards the stem and then they just climb their way up like the stock oh, yeah. and through the buds. And so they basically oh, yeah. kind of weasel their way through, tunnel their way through the buds oh, and they leave, like Mary Beth is saying, they leave these little poop nuggets and that basically Everyone. creates mold. And so by within, you know, days or whatever, your giant cola is now just a big mud or mold factory. And oh, it's, you it's know so what I mean? sad. Yeah. It is so sad. Yeah. And like I say, constant vigilance is your only other thing is, you know, you got to go from plant to plant, but, but try to find the, and that is such an effort. So I like, boy, I keep telling people, get invest in netting, invest in bug zappers. So yeah, what's it the netting? Helps a lot. Is it just bug nets uh, mosquito or netting? Mosquito, mosquito nets. netting. Yeah, yeah, it will keep them out, and it's about the only thing that will, or you know, even uh, the kind of netting that you would use on your screen doors, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. But if you can make some kind of a screened shelter that will keep them from being able to access your plant to lay their freaking eggs, you know, they. Is interesting. Yeah, it's so sad. It's so sad. Well, the bug zappers help a lot because they, they are attracted to that light at night. And you can get quite a few of them that way. I know I had a, a grower in Reno uh, area, and he was been fighting those caterpillars, and that helped him a lot. But it's like, yeah, that's your really about the only hope with those gnarly things. Wow. Well, I mean, you can save some of your crop, but boy, that's usually quite a lot of loss. You've given me a cold dose of reality. I was hoping I could just spray that. some stuff in July and be good. <laughs> I wish. I just don't trust that plan. I don't know how that's going to, you know, have any effect on the flying moths that are going to. Yeah, come totally. They, it doesn't take long for those eggs to hatch. And like you're saying, they're flying around all the time. That's kind of what was challenging to me because, like. I see the moths and the caterpillars clear through September, right? And so right, that's where right. it seemed like no matter when I was spraying, I was getting screwed because yep. I was still finding caterpillars in October, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the worst ones are like the little white ones and the little brown ones. And exactly. Little, you know, in a nondescript looking ugly moths. They They're little tiny the guys. Things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the devil. Well, <laughs> I really appreciate it. This has been a great time talking to you, um, Mary Beth Sanchez. I'm I really so glad we it. made it this week, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all I'm good. I so apologize. It's all good. Um, I'd love to bring you back again sometime and talk more about IPM. Hopefully we'll get the chance. Um, where can folks, um, if folks want to follow you or maybe learn more, if there's anything that you want to plug, basically, uh, I would love to hear it. <laughs> Uh, well, if you want, you can always find me at my IPM page on Instagram, which is MBS IPM for Mary Beth Sanchez Integrated Pest Management. And uh, you can always ask questions there, direct message or whatever. And I do a lot of Growcast interviews, so sometimes you can catch me on Growcast. And, and here we are on Cannabis. So yeah, hey, exactly. We're moving on up. You're a man. podcast mogul. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying to Mary Beth before we started, I was listening to her most recent episode with the Growcast. Um, so, yes, you can find many great podcast episodes um, with Mary Beth Sanchez, where she's uh, been a guest on the Growcast, which is another podcast that I enjoy. And it looks like my yeah. dog just broke into my room here. Um, so it's probably about <laughs> time to, to end the show. So, Another one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There she goes. I see him back there, a little cutie. <laughs> yep. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Mary Beth. I hope you have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend, and um, I'm sure we'll be in touch. It's been my pleasure talking to you, Sam. Yes, and thank you for the invitation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mary Beth. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone out, out in Cannabis land. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, guys and gals. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching this video from Cannabis. I'm Q Grows, the co founder at Cannabis. Behind me is my dog, Josie. And we really appreciate your time today. If you had a great time with this video or you appreciated the knowledge that was shared, please give it a like. Please share this video or other videos from Cannabis with your friends. And definitely do check us out on the web at cannabis.app or search Cannabis in the App Store or the Google Play Store and join the Cannabis community. We are 
are well over 100,000 community members, and you can even become a supporting member so that you can help make more content and help support this community directly through our Cannabis Premium and Associate Producer memberships. That helps support this community directly and helps us keep creating this content. So give us a like, a share, a sign up for Cannabis, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks all.